So tonight, I want to share some thoughts um, on one aspect of compassion training. That as I really looked into this and, and went into the uh, poly canon, there was, I really had a tough time finding anything that specifically addressed the topic of self-compassion. There's a tremendous amount in the literature on the subject of compassion. And if you recall, the, the four Brahma Viharas, loosely translated as the heavenly abodes, compassion is one of the four. Uh, the others being sympathetic joy, which is taking pleasure in someone else's good fortune, uh, equanimity, which probably is best defined as a lack of reactivity, emotional reactivity, um, loving kindness, uh, which we talk about a lot, metta, and then compassion, karuna. I ran across this story, which I'd heard many times, but I didn't remember the source. Um, but it turns out it was Sharon Salzberg, who's one of the early Western Vipassana teachers, sort of her and uh, Jack Cornfield and Joseph Goldstein sort of began this, this Vipassana movement in, in the United States. Um, and she, she tells the story that uh, she was with, a, at, I guess, a retreat or at a meeting with the Dalai Lama in 1990. And she says this, she says, quote, I often think about a memorable conversation I had with His Holiness the Dalai Lama in 1990. I had an opportunity to ask the Dalai Lama a question, so I ventured, Your Holiness, what do you think about self-hatred? He looked at me seemingly confused and asked in response, What's that? It powerfully sums up a fundamental difference between our Western ambition-focused value system and the Buddhist moral compass." Close quotes. So in almost 30, 43 years in practice as a psychologist, many, if not most of the folks that I saw, whatever else brought them into the office, uh, lacked the capacity for self-compassion. It's just something that I think is pervasive in our culture. And it takes lots of forms, self-loathing, self-criticism, self-judgment, um, just beating up on ourselves for any, any number of reasons. And as I'll share a little bit in a little while, it's, it's also something I'm intimately familiar with in my own life. So this is the topic I want to share some thoughts with you tonight. You may know the name Kristen Neff. She's a, actually a research psychologist. I think she's at the University of Texas, Austin. Um, and she's done a ton of research on this topic. Um, and she says there are three indispensable elements of self-compassion. The first is kindness toward ourselves in difficult times versus self-judgment. The second is paying attention to our suffering in a mindful, non-judgmental, non-obsessive way. And the third is the acknowledgement of our common humanity, the recognition that suffering is part of the human experience and not unique to us individually. Now she's done, a, as I said, a lot of studies. That she, she's published a lot in this area. And one of the things which won't come as a surprise is that she, she, in her research she confirmed the notion that it's a lot easier for us to be compassionate toward others than toward ourselves. So I'd like to just take a minute and do a brief reflection if we could. So just think about if you encounter a good friend who's suffering in whatever way, what's your response? What's your response internally? What's your outward response? How you express to your friend? What, what, what happens to you? What do you feel if you encounter someone you care about who brings uh, some state of suffering to your attention? Think about your tone. Think about your choice of words. Think about your body language, all of those things. How would you respond to that person? Now imagine a situation in which you're suffering. What is your response? What are your self-statements? What are you telling yourself when you encounter the suffering? Now, if your responses were markedly different, 
Why do you think that is? I mean, what, what accounts for the difference? When things go wrong in our life, what do we do? Do we become self-critical? Do we hide from others because we feel ashamed of whatever the suffering is? We feel that it's our responsibility, we brought this upon ourselves. Do we have low mood? Do we ruminate about it? Do we obsess about it? Do we go over and over the perceived failing, the perceived inability to handle our suffering in a, in a, in a more uh, effective way? And, and Neff raises the issue of what's the, what's the greater motivator? Is it kindness toward ourselves or is it self-criticism? I mean, I think there's this myth in our culture that self-criticism somehow is, is motivating. It makes us you know, shape up and, 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 and clean up our act. So as I said, I spent some time doing a literature search with the Poly Canon. You can do that online. It's amazing how you can just go to a certain site and, and, and plug in some keywords to see what did the Buddha have to say about self-compassion. I mean, he has tons of stuff to say about compassion, but what about self-compassion? And there are a couple things that I found that were the closest I could find was, was as follows. This is a quote from the Poly Canon. He says, quote, this compassion isn't self-pity or pity for others. It's really feeling one's own pain and recognizing the pain of others. Seeing the web of suffering we're all entangled in, we become kind and compassionate to one another. Close quotes. And then Bhikkhu Bodhi, who's the Buddhist monk and scholar who's translated most of the Pali Canon, talks about uh, another part of the canon where, where the Buddha says uh, protecting oneself one protects others protecting others one protects oneself and he presents that as, as sort of uh, a statement on self-compassion but again I think it's a little bit of a reach so why is this why is there so little emphasis in the Buddha's teaching on this notion of self-compassion. And I think it goes back to what Sharon Salzberg said in that encounter with the Dalai Lama. It has a lot to do with just cultural differences between the East and the West, if we could generalize about it. And this whole notion in the West that we dwell on our problems, we, the causes of them, we rehash them, we go over them, we blame ourselves for them, we relive them, uh, it goes on and on and on. Um, uh, Sharon's talked in the past about that notion of uh, propensia where we just go over and over and over with, with, with these kinds of self-judgments. But it, if one can generalize in the East, I think it's fair to say that folks accept what is and let it go. They move on. Th this is what it is. This is what it is now. It's time to move on. You know, the, the, they value the present moment. That's what they're fully focused on. If, if whatever's happened in the past is past, I can't go back and change it, so I'm not going to continue to dwell on it. It's, it's an acceptance that, that, that who we are without expectations for being perfect, the notion that there's this not the standard of perfection, but rather, uh, you know, this is the way we are, everybody suffers. It's really built in, I think, to a lot of the culture in, in the East. And, and there's sort of a built-in allowance that we're all fundamentally flawed and that we all are human and it's just part of the human condition. So I think there's an acceptance of other people, there's an acceptance of oneself. Um, it allows us to sort of stay in the present, that's the emphasis in our practice of, of being in the presence and not dwelling on past mistakes. So Chris Germer, who's a clinical psychologist, uh, some of you may know his name, has, has written a really wonderful book. It's called The Mindful Path to Self-Compassion. And he's collaborated with Neff, but he really takes it uh, to the next step to sort of talk about what are some of the ways to cultivate this, this particular uh, attitude, this particular way of, of seeing ourselves. And, and one of the things he says that I really like, he talks about mindfulness as being calming. When we meditate, the emphasis is on calming ourselves. And with self-compassion, we're warming ourselves. He said it's a warming kind of, kind of practice. He actually prefers the term inner compassion to self-compassion. And he says that mindfulness asks, what do I know with regard to insight and self-awareness? What is the truth of what is right now in this moment? That's what mindfulness does. What, what do I know? 
Whereas self-compassion asks, what do I need? What do I need with regard to feeling safe? What do, what do I need both for myself and others with regard to feeling accepted as I am, to feeling loved, nurtured, and cared for? So he makes that, that distinction between mindfulness, the insight part of our practice, and the self-compassion part, which really is about what, what are my needs right now? And I think you could generalize from that and talk about self-compassion is one way of, of improving our capacity for self-regulation, for, for, for how we cultivate emotional resilience. That mindfulness helps us self-regulate through attention, and self-compassion helps us regulate by removing the barriers to connection. So much of um, what we're lacking in self-compassion has to do with shame and our need to be, feel hidden, not to be seen. And the real antidote to that is connection, is feeling really, you know, I'm accepted as I am. And it's such a powerful force of of emotional regulation. If you think about an infant, and this is really when it starts, you know, they're, they're distressed, we hold them, we comfort them, and over time they internalize the capacity to do that. You know, if they've had a pretty good developmental trajectory, they develop the capacity to self-regulate, which begins with our soothing and helping them learn to, to self-regulate. And that need for soothing and self-regulation continues throughout our life. It's not just something that matters to infants. It's really an important part of, of, of how we navigate through this life, and self-compassion can be a really important part of that capacity to, to reassure and soothe ourselves. So we really begin this with, with the practice of mindfulness. I mean, that sort of lays the foundation for then building this practice of self-compassion. Uh, and, and the reason it's important is because our mindfulness practice really brings us face to face with those parts of ourselves that we'd rather not look at. Sooner or later, it shines a light into those dark corners. And so now we've been, we've been introduced to these parts of ourselves that we ex spent tremendous time and energy trying to keep away, keep away, hide away. And what do we do with them? I mean, the mindfulness alone perhaps is not sufficient to to confront, confront these parts. And those are the parts that I would argue most need our self-compassion. All those parts that we disavow, that we don't want, want to acknowledge. And, and it really requires us to confront our suffering the, the, uh, about those parts of ourselves head on. You know, we've just got to go there. And there's really no better opportunity uh, than that to practice self-compassion. And in fact, any of the hard practices, the metta practice, um, compassion practice, you know, can be part of this overall way of addressing uh, all the parts of ourselves that we'd rather not look at. You know, the words that we use when we engage in this negative self-appraisal really wound us. I mean, it's a self-wounding kind of activity. And, and really to no good end. I mean, it's, as I said earlier, it's not likely to it, it motivate us to do much else except continue to, to beat on ourselves. So we really have to set an intention to bring compassion, self-compassion to these parts of ourselves as they arise in our practice and in our lives. So let, let's just uh, take a minute, if, if, we, if we could, and um, I'll share some phrases with you that, that really can be part of a self-compassion practice. Um, so just take a minute, if you would, close your eyes and get comfortable. May I live with an open heart. May I live with an open heart. May I feel the love of others toward me. May I feel the love of others toward me. May I celebrate my vulnerability without fear.
May I celebrate my vulnerability without fear. May I see myself as those who love me see me. May I see myself as those who love me see me. And this is my personal favorite. May I be the person that my dog thinks I am. May I be the person that, that my dog thinks I am. So if you would open your eyes, come back into the room. But any of those, when, when added to our meditation, our meta practice, um, can really begin to introduce uh, some self-compassion into the to the practice and I think you can just hear in them that um, they really are a counter to some of these negative self statements that we're so inclined to engage in. You may be familiar with the practice of Tonglen. It's really from the Tibetan tradition and Pema Chodron and her teaching talks a lot about it. And I think we can use a variant of that in our self-compassion practice. As, as, as you may know, we, in Tonglen, we breathe in the suffering of others on the in-breath, and we breathe out love and compassion for others on the exhale. But I would argue that if we're already filled with self-criticism and self-loathing, we may not want to breathe in more suffering. We've got plenty going on already. So what if we change that so that we're going to breathe in compassion for ourselves and then breathe out compassion for others? And just do that as a dedicated practice where we're gonna just change change the way we do it uh, and and have it be about compassion for self and compassion for others in their suffering and again it's really about meeting our suffering head-on you know meeting that self-judgment that self-loathing head-on and we have to open our heart as in that statement a moment ago you know, we intentionally look at and activate those old wounds and meet them with compassion, not with self-judgment, not with self-loathing. Because when we do this, when we meet our suffering with mindful self-compassion, it really transforms the suffering. It really begins to, to change the tone of it. It really begins to reduce the, the, those negative self-appraisals. It takes the sting out of it in many respects. The other thing that it does, and I've certainly seen this in my own practice, it creates more spaciousness around it. We're not so locked in, sort of uh, tunnel vision. We can sort of see it in the larger picture, almost in an Eastern way where it's more about the larger picture of what, do we, what is our role, what is our experience as human beings. We hold it more lightly. If some of you have heard me speak in the past, um, I grew up in a southern family where what really mattered was appearances. I mean, that was part of that strata of, of southern culture that, you know, it, nothing else really mattered except how things looked externally. You know, anything that didn't look good had to be disavowed, hidden, never addressed, never talked about. And the result, what for me anyway, was this profound sense of isolation. You know, of not being known, of not being seen. When, you, when it's all the emphasis on external achievement, external appearances, it's as though nobody really knows or cares who you really are. You know, you don't have this sense of uh, being loved for who you are. You, you feel you're being loved for how you appear or what your achievements are. So all of that, you know, the, the feeling of being loved and accepted was predicated on these superficial things, manners, grades, dress, which college you got into, how many graduate degrees did you have, That's, that was what mattered. And, and this, this, for me at least, was just ripe ground for self-judgment, to, to, to feel as though that standard for these external, unspoken criteria was, was never met. You know, that, that, the assumption being that you're defective while everyone else isn't. You know, you're the one because no one can talk about that they're struggling. You just think you're the only one struggling. So it's real easy to cultivate this sense of shame about vulnerability, about your needs. And, and this was just part of, you know, part of the water that I swam in. And, and yet when I finally found my way some years ago to, to the Dharma, to this practice, it was as though the scales just fell away from my eyes. 
you know, I felt like I'd finally encountered the truth of human experience with a capital T that was right there in front of me. And I don't mean to suggest that, you know, I just found this and boom, everything was terrific, that my suffering was immediately gone, but rather, I felt there was a path out of the suffering. There was now a, a road map. There was something that made sense. It didn't say, you know, keep achieving, keep doing well, and in the next life you'll be rewarded. You can sit at the right hand of God or whatever. It was, no, right here, right now, this is a path out of the suffering. And that's what really just immediately resonated. Chris Germer again talks about three stages of this process, and, and, and as I uh, read this, it was it really mirrored with my own experience. It was really about confronting all that self-judgment and where, the, where it, it had originated. He says the first stage of the process is the striving. This notion that if I work hard enough, I can change the relationship that I've had with myself for all these years. So the first thing we do when we encounter this is strive. We're going to fix it. The second stage is disillusionment. The fact that, you know, this idealized notion that this practice is going to be a quick fix and rid me of all my defects, that whole notion crashes. I mean, there's the disillusionment. You're thinking, gee, I thought this was going to be my way out of this. What's the matter? Where, why do I still have all these perceived defects? You know, realizing that all this striving was not enough. It didn't matter that my lifelong solution to any obstacle to do harder, to put your nose to the grindstone, uh, was not enough. And then finally, what he calls the subtle aggression of self-improvement. I love that phrase. The subtle aggression of self-improvement. Out of that comes a true self, true acceptance. The compassion toward ourselves, knowing and accepting ourselves that we're the same person we were, but now it's okay. You know, you just kind of begin to cross that threshold, begin to feel that, yeah, nothing's really different, but now I can have a different relationship with it. And that's really where the self-compassion can start to arise. You know, we, th th we're in a place now where we can respond to our own suffering. We can do fine responding to anyone else's suffering. But now I'm in a place where I can respond to my own suffering as though I might to a, a sick child, an injured child, a, a friend who's really in a tough spot. You know, really make friends with, with, one's own, with my own imperfections, with our own imperfections. You know, that I'm no longer thinking necessarily all the time that I'm a project that has to be fixed. There's more kindness, there's more gentleness, there's more acceptance in there. Germer says at the end of this process, or in the course of this process, we end up being a compassionate mess. <laughs> so I want to close with an excerpt from a poem, I'm not going to read the whole thing, uh, by John O'Donohue. Some of you may know his work. He's a really wonderful poet. It's called, uh, the, the whole poem, and I'm just going to read an excerpt, is called A Blessing for Someone Who Is Exhausted. He says, you have traveled too fast over false ground. Now your soul has come to take you back. Take refuge in your senses. Open up to all the small miracles you rushed through. Become inclined to watch the way of rain when it falls slow and free. Imitate the habit of twilight, taking time to open the well of color that fostered the brightness of day. Draw alongside the silence of stone until its calmness can claim you. Be excessively gentle with yourself. Stay clear of those vexed in spirit. Learn to linger around someone of ease who feels they have all the time in the world. Gradually you will return to yourself, having learned a new respect for your heart and the joy that dwells far within slow time. So, thank you. <laughs>